don't believe that excuse, well, do you? Well, we still need to investigate it. No, but I... in your heart, you don't believe it. The jury's still out. The buck stops yeah, with the government. Of course it does, it? of course it does, but government... You can't absolve them of responsibility no, well, no, no, of course here. not. I'm not suggesting that. It isn't wrong just because you don't get an international consensus, is it? There's a big difference between what happened in Iraq, in my view, and Kosovo or Sierra Leone. Hard-hitting, hard talk. Weeknights at 11.30 on BBC News 24. In or out, Ian Duncan Smith's leadership of the Conservative Party is being decided. This is the scene at Westminster Live, where the result of the vote of confidence is due within an hour. Mr Duncan Smith says the past six weeks have been a vision of hell. Well, we're also live outside Conservative Central Office, where the press pack waits for the Tory leader. In other news, charged with misconduct, Rio Ferdinand faces a ban over missing a drugs test. And the IRA says there's little hope of progress in the peace process and blames the unionists. This is BBC News 24 with Fiona Trott and Matthew Amrilly Waller. Good evening. Ian Duncan Smith's political career will be decided within the hour. Tory MPs will shortly finish voting on whether to keep him as their leader. Earlier in the Commons, on what could have been his last appearance on the opposition front bench, he was taunted by Labour MPs with choruses of bye-bye. Well, Mr Duncan Smith has told his MPs that the last six weeks have been a vision of hell. He's urged them to back him and not to plunge the party into another damaging leadership election. Well, as we say, Tories are voting at the moment. They've got another half an hour to get their votes in. Then at seven o'clock, the result will be announced live on television. Ian Duncan Smith needs 51% of the vote if he's to survive as leader. Well, let's go straight to our chief political correspondent, Gitto Harry. He joins me live from Conservative Central Office. Gitto, over to you. Good evening, Matthew. You've seen the cameras, you've seen the crowd here. If you were here, you could sense the anticipation. Ian Duncan Smith expected at any moment uh, now. And a man who's pulled out all the stops today, put up his possibly last fight against Tony Blair across the dispatch box, looked his party in the eye behind closed doors, told them that they've got to be mad if any of them wants to be leader of the opposition, but he does because he wants to be Prime Minister. A very powerful personal speech, we're told, a speech where he was, of course, fighting for his life because for the last few hours, Tory MPs have been going into committee room 14, they've been given a piece of paper and they've been actually uh, putting their cross uh, to his name or against his name. And what we're waiting to find out within the hour is, does he have the confidence of his party? Does he have the renewed mandate that he asked his party to give him or has his party just pulled the plug on his leadership? And Gitto, did that speech change minds? Are we getting any indication of how the maths is actually stacking up? I think it might have swung a few votes, but basically the arithmetic was there beforehand, I think. He's anticipating doing uh, better than most people yesterday predicted, and people around him think he'll put up a decent show, but very few of them at this stage, when the votes are really in, almost all of them, expect him to be leader an hour from now. It has been interesting listening to his pitch today, talking about the damage if there's a, a wider leadership contest, because he has been concentrating uh, deliberately on something that is in fact a negative, not the positive things about Ian Duncan Smith. Well, you're right. I think behind closed doors he tried to sort of uh, give away a bit of what makes him tick and why he wants to be leader and why he wants to be Prime Minister. But you're right, there's been a lot of menacing threats from Ian Duncan Smith over the last uh, few weeks and the last few hours, trying to tell this party that whatever the appetite for a change, they should think long and hard about what change involves not least what it involves in the next few weeks, a time when, of course, he's quite right to say the party could be giving the Labour government a hard time, but instead now looks poised to plunge itself into uh, some real turmoil. 
talk to those MPs who very soberly having agonized, they didn't take these decisions uh, swiftly over the last few weeks. This has been a really long, painful, drawn out process. They haven't just jumped over the edge of the cliff over this. They've thought long and hard. They know what the problems are. They know there's no clear alternative. They know that a leadership contest could be painful, but they've still decided with cool, calm reflection that even that is better than sticking with Ian Duncan Smith for another perhaps two years into a general election. And uh, Gitto behind the scenes, away from the cameras, has the wider campaigning among the other candidates if there is to be a, a wider leadership contest. Has that started? An hour from now, Matthew, I think there will be certain phone numbers that you simply will not be able to ring. They'll be engaged. They'll be engaged because there will be people who've been manoeuvring subtly over the last few days. They'll be briefing the press. They'll be calling in supporters. They'll be appointing campaign managers all poised. Four names keep coming up. Whoever I talk to, Michael Howard, the bookie's favourite we've heard on News24 this afternoon, talked about by a lot of Tory MPs as the kind of guy they can all rally around. That, I would imagine, if he wants the job, would be something that would unnerve him, because those sort of people often don't end up holding the reins when it's all done and dusted. David Davis, I would be astonished tonight if he doesn't make it clear that he wants the job and will actually run for it. Michael Ancrum, deputy leader of the party, has gone for it before. He He'd put himself up as a unifying figure, a man who everybody could live with. He's a likable old toff at the very least, and a man who sort of holds the centre ground. I think he'll probably be very tempted, and if he doesn't go for it, he'll want somebody else to promise him something for his support. And finally, a man called uh, Tim Yeo, who's in the shadow cabinet, who sees himself as perhaps flying the flag of the portalistas, the modernisers. Four names and others, of course, watching from the sidelines too. OK, Gitto, stay there because, as you say, Ian Duncan Smith expected there shortly. But for now, thanks very much. Well, it's been a fascinating uh, afternoon and early evening. Our reporter, Martin Popwell, has been looking back at all the key developments of today. Half past three and voting on whether Ian Duncan Smith remains leader of the Conservative Party begins. His fate is being decided right now in this committee room in the House of Commons by Tory members of Parliament. Who will be I, uh, of the Tory away. party tomorrow, sir? I will. This morning, Mr Duncan Smith was full of confident words, but the reality is he's fighting for his political life. He says the last thing the Conservative Party needs is a leadership contest. I think the choice is simple. Either we decide to give me that mandate and for me to go on tomorrow to lead this party in opposition and to take the fight to Labour, present that alternative, or to plunge ourselves into internecine warfare for the next two to three months and have to pick up the pieces when the public says, what have they been doing? At Prime Minister's questions this afternoon, the leadership issue was being discussed by MPs from all parties. In, uh, in view of the renewed interest in crime figures, especially on the Tory benches, will my right honourable friend consider that backstabbing becomes a criminal offence? But seemingly unfazed by this afternoon's vote, Ian Duncan Smith chose the, the issues of crime and Europe to question Tony Blair. Crime. Gun crime is up, violent crime is up and overall crime is up. But many believe despite the confident performance, this will be his last question time as leader of the Conservative Party. I asked for there to be this vote because I believe that we would have a better chance of unseating the government uh, if we had a stronger leader, someone who was more charismatic. Uh, and I hope that we get that chance tomorrow. Before the vote, Mr Duncan Smith addressed MPs in what's being described as the best speech he's ever made. Supporters called it blazingly honest and very direct. I don't think the speech will have made any difference to the way people vote, because I think people will have made up their mind by now. And um, so it's in the lap of the gods, uh, but it was a good speech. If he loses the vote, the current frontrunner is Michael Howard. Another contender, popular with the Tory grassroots, is David Davis, but both are remaining loyal, for the moment at least. Voting in the confidence motion will end at 6.30 tonight. The result is expected at around 7. By then, the Conservative Party could well be looking for a new leader. Martin Popplewell, BBC News, Conservative Central Office. Well, let me take you live to Conservative Central Office and just show you the scene there because uh, events have moved apace and uh, that is the scene with uh, the assembled press pack because Ian Duncan Smith due there fairly shortly. We've been saying that for some time, but uh, he appears to be slightly delayed. But, uh, of course, voting finishes in uh, slightly over 20 minutes. So, uh, 
Most of the MPs will have voted, 83, that magic figure that uh, Ian Duncan Smith uh, will be looking for. And of course the result will be made public at 7pm. Uh, there you see it also on our caption. Well, monitoring all this afternoon's developments has been Professor Robert Worcester. He's chairman, of course, of the Pollsters, Mori, and he's with me here in the studio. Uh, and Bob, we've been listening through the course of this afternoon to uh, a selection of people uh, who are against Ian Duncan Smith and some for Ian Duncan Smith. And you uh, have noticed an interesting split in terms of, uh, uh, of loyalists and anti-Ian Duncan Smith, in terms of constituencies and majorities. Well, we've only had one who is anti, and that's Crispin Blunt, who has been conspicuously anti. Now, he sits with 49% on our current figures, uh, voting for him as uh, the next Tory candidate or next Tory parliamentarian. So he's sitting in a safe seat, but the others, uh, Ann Whittacombe, 51% on current figures. In other words, if we adjust for the swing, 4.2%, from the last election, to the Tories, we're still looking in majority overall of 81 for Labour. But Ann Whittacombe, Angela Browning, Andrew Rossend uh, Rossendale in Romford, Ann Whittacombe of course in Maidstone, um, uh, Tiverton for Angela Browning, John Greenway, uh, they're all in dead safe seats. So it's all very well for them to be loyal. It's all very well for them to say unite, but the people who are really forcing Ian Duncan Smith out of office, as I suspect we'll hear, in just a, less than an hour are the people who are running scared. The people, there's nothing that focuses the mind of a politician than the threat of loss of office. And you're looking at a whole bunch of Tories who, if they continue with Ian Duncan Smith, are looking at losing their seats. And boy, does this concentrate their minds. And of course, you've tracked this. It's interesting to uh, see the events of today with that uh, speech to the 1922. And of course, we saw the speech at the conference, which was supposed to save him. But uh, your tracking of Ian Duncan Smith and the problems that he has, well, that dates back almost to the point where he actually took the job. Oh, it does. Almost to day one. Now, the public generally give a new candidate, a new uh, leader of a party, a couple of months to, uh, be, to come accustomed to who this is, who this new face is on the box, who, and they listen. And so you have a, a wide number of people who say, I just don't know whether I'm satisfied with this uh, member of parliament who's now the leader of this party or that party. It happened with John Major. It happened with, um, with uh, Tony Blair when he became leader. Uh, but with Ian Duncan Smith, it was very clear very quickly that the don't knows over half the public in the first month's poll, by the second month we're moving over to the dissatisfied, not satisfied with the performance. And at the moment, there are more people who are Tory loyalists who intend to vote Tory at the next election who say they are dissatisfied with Ian Duncan Smith than say that they are satisfied. And that says the 320 people in the, 320,000 people in the constituencies who are the Tory party members are out of touch with their own voters. So of course that is what has brought it to a head now and this vote in terms of party image well of course uh, it goes without saying that has taken an absolute battering over the last few days and uh, weeks. Uh, what are your polling's finding on party image and how it can be rescued if it can be rescued? There's a thing we call political triangulation, which has to do with the image of the leader, the image of the party, and the issues that are facing the electorate. And they range from about 60% image and 40% issues. And the party image, the Tory party image at the moment, our most recent poll for the Financial Times in September uh, that we measured this, the Conservative Party's image compared to the other two parties is that it's seen as extreme, it's divided, and it's out of touch. Not a particularly good hand to bring to the table. OK, plenty more from you, Bob, but a little later. But for now, thanks Thank once you. again. And just to remind you, you saw the pictures there of uh, central office. We're still waiting for Ian Duncan Smith to actually arrive back at uh, Tory central office. He will listen to the way that that uh, vote pans out in, what, 45 minutes' time. And uh, we understand he will also uh, make a speech 
there on the steps of Conservative Central Office once those figures have actually been released by Sir Michael Spicer at uh, Committee Room 14, and we expect that at 7 o'clock. Uh, well, that is uh, the situation with that vote for Ian Duncan Smith. Well, the time here is approaching uh, 6.15. One other important story to bring you, though, before we return to Ian Duncan Smith, of course, because uh, the IRA has issued a statement this evening blaming David Trimble and his Ulster Unionist Party for the collapse last week of a deal to restore devolved government to Northern Ireland. It says the IRA honoured its commitment to decommission weapons, but says other parties have not kept their side of the bargain and have not explained why. Well, our Ireland correspondent Dennis Murray is in Belfast for us. Uh, Dennis, just tell us a little more about the statement. Well, furthermore and for by, as they say here in Northern Ireland, uh, the IRA, without naming the Ulster Unionists, but clearly that's who they're talking about, uh, say that they haven't given a credible explanation uh, for stopping that process of sequencing, choreography, whatever you want to call it, that was supposed to work last Tuesday, the day the Prime Minister uh, called the Assembly election. So the tone of it's very angry, but I think what's interesting as well is what's not in the statement, because what the IRA has done in the past when there's been one of these problems in the peace process where they feel they've done the right thing, and that the unionists have not, that the unionists have let them down. What they've done in the past is the IRA has broken off its contact uh, with the decommissioning body headed by General John de Shastlin. Now, they haven't said that in this statement, so while the tone is one of anger, definitely, maybe even a little bit of bewilderment, um, but certainly very angry, it doesn't rule out the possibility of deal-making deal in the future. Yes, exactly uh, on that point, because, of course, when this all broke down, uh, the focus initially was on the Republicans to make some sort of movement. So your analysis, is it that uh, that hasn't been ruled out altogether at some time by this statement? I would say that's about right, but I don't think anyone expects it. In fact, I think we can pretty emphatically rule out any kind of even negotiation until after the election's held, which is at the end of next month. Now, what might happen after that, we don't know. There could be, uh, there's room in the Good Friday Agreement for a review of the workings of the agreement. Uh, so it might be kicked into review. Uh, there might be more negotiations between the Ulster Unionists and the Republicans after that. But what a lot of the other parties were saying to Sinn Féin and the IRA was that the only way out of this was for the IRA to waive their right to uh, confidentiality and allow either General de Chastelin or Sinn Féin uh, to give some more details, to give David Trimble the clarity he's seeking. But I think it's perfectly clear from the IRA statement that, you know, their view is we did precisely what was asked of us. The Ulster Unionists knew the Sinn Féin position and our position, and yet they still stopped the process. So it's going to be very tricky to get out of this, and it's not going to happen before the end of November. Uh, these things often boil, though, down to hard politics because uh, if the current position uh, is maintained, uh, it, it may play into the hands of the Democratic Unionist Party in the elections, uh, and that could lead to, to deadlock in terms of power sharing. How difficult is this present situation for David Trimble to go into those elections? difficult enough but it was always difficult you remember the divisions within his own party uh, and all those meetings he had to have of the party's ruling body that made the party look divided uh, just the way we've been hearing about the conservative party was looking divided and indeed it is deeply divided but uh, uh, David Trimble's been saying there were a lot of good things done Jerry Adams speech there were lots of good things in that they have made progress and there's another side to this coin as well which is this if the, I the IRA endorsed Jerry Adams uh, position which was politics only peaceful and democratic means only well, if the IRA is committed to that, then surely they will see this as a political problem and try and work their way through it. And certainly the one thing I keep saying is the only certainty in this process is that Tony Blair and Bertie Ahern, no matter what the reverse is, they'll just draw breath, reconsider and try again. OK, Dennis Murray there in Belfast. Thanks once again. The time now is 18 minutes past six. Let's take a look at the headlines. The votes are being cast at Westminster. Ian Duncan Smith's future as leader of the Conservative Party hangs in the balance. A vision of hell, Mr Duncan Smith tells his colleagues of the ordeal he's endured over the past six weeks. The IRA says it has honoured its commitments but sees little hope for progress unless others do the same. And in sport, Rio Ferdinand has been charged with misconduct by the FA. It follows his misdrugs test in September. He has now 14 days to appeal. England's rugby union side will face two charges of misconduct at a hearing tomorrow after fielding an extra player against Samoa at the weekend.
And Ricky Clark's fifth wicket stand with Nasser Hussain helped England's cricketers recover after a middle order collapse in the second test against Bangladesh. Those are the headlines. We'll have more in half an hour. See you then. Now, our chief political correspondent, Gitu Harry, joins us now from Conservative Central Office. What's the atmosphere down there, Gitu? Well, a great sense of anticipation, as you can guess, if you just could see what I see behind uh, the lens there. All kinds of cameras, loads of people, some members of the public stopping by to see what all the excitement is about. And inside there, of course, a lot of activity. I've just been uh, told that Ian Duncan Smith's due back here shortly. We've been uh, expecting that for a while. Hard to know where exactly he is now. And when the result comes through, from what I gather, still just before 7 o'clock, or perhaps even on the dot at 7, but not much before then, then Ian Duncan Smith will come out through that door and he'll come here and he'll tell us what the, uh, how he sees the situation now. Everybody's anticipating, I think, even those close to him, that the result will be adios, good night Vienna to Ian Duncan Smith and all he'll be doing here will be trying to sort of leave the stage with a bit of dignity and credibility intact. What do you think is going on behind those doors behind you there? It would be good to be a fly on the wall, wouldn't it? It would be fantastic. I've, I've had um, messages from some people inside there during the course of the day, some of them jokingly referring to the place as cold dits, uh, some of them joking about how they need new jobs and wouldn't it be nice to have a job where uh, you were uh, pretty confident your boss was a bit more secure in his job than uh, Ian Duncan Smith has been in his own, trying to be sort of quite upbeat at a time when clearly for a lot of these people there's a lot on the line. Uh, some of them are employed by the party, some of them are clearly people who have been taken on by Ian Duncan Smith themselves and if there's a new leader there's usually a new regime and a whole lot of people uh, leave with the ancien regime and uh, that means a lot of anxiety in there but of course these things are exciting if people go into politics this is the kind of stuff they love even when they're on the losing side and uh, uh, and it hurts but it's fun and talking of uh, potential new leaders what about the likes of uh, Michael Howard have you have you heard from people like that or are they being quite tight-lipped He's been very, very well behaved for the last few weeks and he's been very, very well behaved today. I can tell you that in all honesty. I've looked him in the eye and talked to him about this. He's been genuinely uh, loyal to Ian Duncan Smith, genuinely impressed by how Ian Duncan Smith has raised his game over the last few days. But that said, an hour from now, all the bets are off. If Ian Duncan Smith is no longer leader, then Michael Howard is hardly going to step aside and say, no, I really don't want the, more, uh, the top job in the Conservative Party, having been an active Conservative uh, for decades now. He got into the Conservatives at Cambridge like an awful lot of other people years ago. He served in a Conservative uh, government and uh, of course he would like that job and I think we'll find out from him uh, uh, very shortly that uh, he'll be a candidate and the bookie's favourite already. And Gitto, we've just seen the briefest of shots of uh, Ian Duncan Smith uh, arrive there uh, behind you. Uh, so he is now inside Conservative Central Office and we're, what, uh, only about 40 minutes away from that uh, decision actually being made public. It is going to be an excruciating 40 minutes for him. It is. Very poignant, Matthew. I was tipped off this morning that they put champagne in the fridges inside here in Central Office. And uh, when I sort of expressed... Uh, incredulity at that. Oh, you can see the arrangements uh, going on. We've got a lectern being assembled. But champagne on ice, yes. Wasn't that a sort of hostage to fortune? Wasn't that counting the chickens? Dream up the cliches. But basically, what a crazy thing to do if you weren't sure that your leader was going to be in a position to celebrate. What they were kind of telling me is in a fatalistic mood, either way, if he's lost, then he can pop open the champagne corks because he can spend a lot more time in a very nice mansion that he has in Buckinghamshire, spend more time with his lovely wife, Betsy, get away from all this nonsense. And of course, if he's won, then he's got a renewed mandate, as he puts it, and he goes on to challenge Tony Blair for the keys to number 10 at the next election. Uh, Gitto, if he has not won, as all the analysts uh, seem to uh, conclude, is there any way that the party can short-circuit this procedure to get itself a new leader without the sort of bloodbath that IDS has been talking about? Well, there are people who want to do that. There are people who desperately want to do that. But you need to square an awful lot of people for that. And frankly, you need to square an awful lot of big egos for that. And try though they will, these deals have a, a bad habit of sort of unravelling and while you might square one person, that changes another man's calculation. And nobody really wants to be patched up in a deal if there's a danger of somebody they don't particularly like or respect or 
f don't fancy their chances over their own, s jumping in at the last moment and having a competition. So I'd be surprised if they can do it that neatly. What is the case though, and this is different to how it was last time, I think the main ideological, strategic decisions have been taken by this party. I can't see anyone who is not Eurosceptic pretty much on the right and pretty much uh, in tune with, ironically, what Ian Duncan Smith has done with the party and where he's pointed the party actually being in there. So it's much more about personality from now on. Doesn't mean it won't be vicious, but it'll be a bit less fundamental. Gitto, I'll let you away to uh, speak to as many Tory MPs as you can, but uh, thanks once again. That's uh, Gitto Harry there at Central Office. Let me take you live uh, to uh, another part of Westminster and show you the scene there, because as the time creeps round to uh, 6.30, it is at 6.24 at the moment, so what, there's about uh, five, six minutes of voting left. Uh, virtually all of those uh, 165 Tory MPs will now have voted. Uh, the boxes will close in about uh, five minutes' time. They will then spend about uh, 25 minutes uh, counting the various votes and uh, at seven o'clock we are told we will hear the result and uh, interesting that they have also said that they will give the breakdown of the vote so 165 votes it's pretty easy maths they need uh, 83 to secure a victory for Ian Duncan Smith. Well, watching still is Bob Worcester who's uh, chairman of the pollsters Mori and uh, Bob in your view are we watching the last 35 minutes of Ian Duncan Smith's leadership? I believe indeed that we are. Uh, I think it's almost inconceivable that Ian Duncan Smith could have uh, garnered enough votes to hold on the 83 votes uh, when he only got 54 in the leadership contest in the House uh, just two years ago. So um, I, I just think it's uh, the end of Ian Duncan Smith as a uh, leader of the Conservative Party and it's a fresh start for the Conservative Party in a way. There is, I believe, uh, just under 18 months to go to the next general election. Uh, there is time for the new leader to be bedded in. And one thing that he has done, he's put them in better shape in terms of the issues facing the country in the public view than the Tories have enjoyed since 1992 and Black Wednesday, September the 16th, when the pound fell out of the ERM. There are the top six issues. Labor has the largest lead. Uh, a large lead on the top two, National Health Service and Education. But the next four issues, the Tories are either level pegging, which is pensions, or on law and order, a substantial lead, on asylum seekers, uh, fifth place, a very substantial lead among the 39% of the public who say this is an important issue facing this country, and taxation, they've got an 11 point lead. So four of the top six issues the Tories are actually leading today, and that's the legacy that he will pass on to his successor. But you said at the start of that answer, it's an opportunity to start again. I mean, is it that simple that you can just shed all of what we've seen over the last few weeks and months and simply start again? The public are pretty canny. Yes, they certainly are. They're not so green as cabbage looking is the phrase. But uh, when you look at where they are today, Frankly, they can hardly get any worse. They have been flatlining at between 30 and 35 percent, and actually a bit below that at some of their nadir points. Uh, for over 10 years, it's been a long time in the wilderness for them because immediately after the 92 election, they went to the doldrums and they've been there ever since. Now, I don't think they're going to win the next election, which I expect to be on the 5th of May, 2005. You heard it here first. And uh, on that day, I think Labour will be re-elected. Uh, uh, acts of God, perhaps, uh, otherwise. But, but Labour found themselves in this exact position not that long ago. And the essential thing uh, under Neil Kinnock, of course, was to, to drag the margins back at uh, the next election. So it meant that the election after that was within touching distance. Precisely. And that is presumably what is the, the key thing here for the Tories. Uh, that is, and that's why I made the point about these issues, because Ian Duncan Smith has made a contribution that's so far unrecognized uh, to the rebuilding of the Conservative Party. Now if they can get themselves a new leader who will build on that, then they're not going to win the next election, but they could be in a position to win the election after that with yet another leader, probably. But we'll see. And just one other thing, 
Uh, I was reminded when I heard Git O'Hara talking about getting champagne out. In 1992, <clears throat> there was a leak of the exit poll, and uh, the Labor Party uh, was sent uh, down to the St. Ermans Hotel to uh, set up the ballroom and put the champagne on ice. And the chap who was sent to do it, now in the House of Lords, mentioning no names, said it was a long and lonely night, election night, 1992. Very, very briefly, a couple of sure. sentences. Uh, can somebody else turn it around, do you think? Between now and 2005? No way, Jose. So uh, they're looking for, for, what, two leaders or one leader to take them through two elections? It, it could be either, because if the newly elected leader, which I expect to have happen between now and the end of the year, if that person can build on the good foundation that he's got and then cut the uh, labor lead in half, then the next leader might just be able to do it in 2009. Okay, Bob Worcester, thanks once again for all of those thoughts. Uh, thanks for taking us through that analysis through the course of this evening. Well, you're watching BBC News 24. The time is exactly within one or two seconds of 6.30. It is 6.30 now and the vote has closed. And uh, the votes, whichever way they've gone this afternoon in a frenzy there at Westminster, well, there is no changing things. The votes are in and uh, Ian Duncan Smith's future now is to be decided. They will count those votes. That is the scene live at Central Office. The counting will go on in committee room 14 and at about uh, five to seven they will begin to uh, come around to actually making that uh, position public and there you see Michael Howard go in to central office as uh, just like yesterday the key figures Oliver Letwin slipped in there a moment ago and uh, all the key players there go in to lend their support to Ian Duncan Smith because uh, we will get a decision at uh, 7 o'clock. And of course, if he wins, he continues. If he loses, well, of course, then we're in the territory of a full leadership contest. And uh, all those people, the likes of Michael Howard, have been talked about uh, as uh, potential candidates. Well, I'm sure they will then begin to make their positions clear. David Davis going in. And uh, they're all asked questions, but of course, no one uh, at this stage willing to give uh, any comments. Uh, interesting David Davis going in there because he wasn't there when Ian Duncan Smith gave those comments uh, at uh, the same location yesterday. We had Oliver Letwin, we had Theresa May, we had uh, Michael Howard there surrounding Ian Duncan Smith. But um, we didn't get uh, um, David Davis, so he goes in there uh, into central office. And uh, I'm now being told that uh, we are expecting the result at five minutes to seven. So uh, the counting isn't going to take that long. It's a pretty straightforward procedure. So a result at uh, five minutes to seven. You can see the microphones all set up because Ian Duncan Smith is going to say a few words after the result is in. Either way, he will make his comments known. He won't take questions. It is going to be a short statement. And uh, these, the last few minutes for Ian Duncan Smith to wait to see how this decisive vote goes on his leadership. In a little more than 20 minutes' time, we will know if he has lost this vote to continue as Conservative leader or indeed has got that mandate to continue. So we are in the last few minutes. That is the scene live there at Tory Central Office. Now let's bring you some breaking news that has just come into us now from the uh, about the anti-war MP George Galloway. You remember that he was expelled by the party last week for bringing the party into disrepute. He was accused of uh, inciting uh, Arabs to attack British troops and uh, backing anti-war candidates. We've just heard now that he's decided his next moves in his battle with the Labour Party. He's going to stand against Labour in the European elections next year across England and Wales and he's taking the party to court over his expulsion. Uh, he claims the party broke its own rules when he was expelled last week but he won't be resigning his Glasgow seat to create an early by-election but he's decided that he will stand against Labour in the European elections next year across England and Wales. That news just in. 
Well, obviously, we will return to developments at Westminster in the next few minutes. But uh, a couple of important stories to get through first. And, of course, Rio Ferdinand has been charged with misconduct this evening by the English Football Association over his failure to take a drugs test last month. The England international and Manchester United player will have 14 days to respond to the charge and to request a personal appeal. He could still face a ban. Meanwhile, FIFA has said it won't interfere in the FA's handling of the case. Well, let's get more. Our sports news correspondent Ollie Foster joins me here in the studio. Uh, Ollie, first of all, uh, let us uh, nail down, because there was a certain amount of confusion through the course of the afternoon, the charge itself. Do we know, is it the lesser of the charges or the more serious charge? Well, it would be a lesser charge if the FA could say we accept that you forgot to take the test. It will be a more serious charge if they say you actually dodged the test, you deliberately missed the test. But what they've done, it's a catch-all. And over the next few weeks, uh, Rio Ferdinand will become very familiar with Rule E26, Regulation 1C, which refers to the failure or refusal by a player to submit a drug, a drug, to drug testing as required by a competent official. So what they're saying is that, um, right, we'll come and see you again. Uh, to, you have to prove that you forgot this test. Uh, you still think, you know, you may have actually uh, refused to take this test. Now, uh, Man Manchester United, they've confirmed that Ferdinand will request a personal hearing, so the wheels are now in motion. The FA will be looking for a date for Rio Ferdinand to come and prove to them that he just forgot this test. The misconduct charge was always going to come. He could not refute the fact that he did not take that drugs test. So that's nailed it down. We have a charge. It still could be the most serious charge, that is still to be decided, but uh, in terms of the potential sanctions, the potential penalties, just run through the options that the FA has. Well, if he, it depends how seriously they take this, because under the old regime, before Mark Palliot has come and taken charge, uh, the FA were notoriously lenient and slow with uh, bringing their drugs process, processes into play, but under the World Anti-Doping Agency, FIFA, who are watching on, the FA are going to have to be seen to be doing something pretty serious with Rio Ferdinand for missing a test, which in a lot of other sports is seen as serious as failing a test itself. So we're looking at if he just forgot three months, if they found that he actually dodged this test, they'll have to ask him why did you dodge this test because that becomes a lot more sinister. Uh, you could be looking for six months to a year, the maximum penalty being two years. And of course, uh, the FA under the new man want to get uh, tough on drugs and drug testing. FIFA too, watching proceedings very closely, they too want to get tough. Absolutely. They're, they're kind of thinking about signing up to this world anti-doping agency, the WADA code, a sort of catch-all for all sports where straight away you'd get a, a two-year ban for dodging a test, forgetting a test, failing a drugs test, and that's some way off, but they will be watching to see what the FA do on this case. And uh, it's just a shame that he is the world's most expensive uh, defender, the, the Britain's most expensive player at 30 million pounds. And yes, there will be those people, fans groups have come forward tonight saying, uh, you're making an example of him. Well, unfortunately, Rio Ferdinand, uh, despite how good a player and an England player that he is, uh, he has. He's up there for misconduct, for, if not failing to take the test, uh, refusing. OK, Ollie Foster, thanks very much indeed for that update. Well, it is uh, just after 25 minutes to 7. Let's return straight away to Westminster, to Conservative Party central office, because we're not that far away from the result on that vote of confidence in, in Duncan Smith. Let's go to our political correspondent, Jonathan Beale, who's there for us. Uh, Jonathan, it was fascinating to watch uh, who just trooped in in the last few minutes into central office to keep in Duncan Smith company as he hears this result. Indeed, we see most of the shadow cabinet wandering here, not answering questions, moving in quickly, uh, obviously to watch the result come in on television. Uh, they will be with Ian Duncan Smith. We haven't seen him arrive. We don't know if he's going to enter through the back door, but uh, he will come out here. He'll make a statement at that stand soon after the result uh, at about five to seven. Um, those uh, votes are now being counted in committee room 14. Uh, we understand that Sir Michael Spicer, chairman of the 1922 committee, is overseeing that. Uh, Owen Patterson, an aide to Ian Duncan Smith, is also there. Three other members of the 22 committee. So they are looking through those uh, votes at the moment and we're expecting that result very soon indeed.
Uh, Jonathan, stay with us because uh, I gather that Ian Duncan Smith has arrived uh, at, at the back door at uh, Central Office. Uh, so he is there in the building with those other shadow uh, cabinet ministers that uh, we saw go in. But we've got some pictures of him actually uh, after voting, uh, arriving at a flat as well. Let's just uh, show our viewers those pictures of the Tory leader just a little earlier through the course of this evening. And I gather a few reporters threw questions at him as he arrived. Find out, I'm very confident. Really confident. Yeah. Really, really. Really, really. Well, uh, no real surprise there that he says he's uh, really confident, but uh, if he has read the papers, listened to all his uh, party MPs, listened to the analysts, well, I suppose confidence will be the last thing that really he is feeling this evening. Yes, I mean, we don't know his true feelings, um, but he is a military man. He doesn't want to show weakness uh, right up to the last moment. I mean, I have to say that I've talked to people who are backing his campaign, supporting him, and they believe it is on a knife edge that he could still win this. But I think a lot of Tory MPs believe that it's got this far, that uh, they're going to have to get rid of him as well. Uh, so I think that the expectations, certainly the discussions going on uh, inside Westminster among Tory MPs is who would you like to see next as Tory leader? So uh, we're going to have to wait for the results. It may be t tight, it may be close, uh, but there are Tory MPs already talking about the next stage, about who may be uh, the new leader of the party, um, uh, and uh, already names such as uh, Michael Howard himself, uh, David Davis, Tim Yeo, uh, and Michael Ancrum being talked about, uh, but obviously nobody's going to make a move until they know the result of this contest, of, of this course. vote of confidence. Of course, and we don't want to preempt that. We're only, what, 15 minutes away from that result. But uh, just, in a sense, go through the process that would be triggered if he lost this vote. Well, if he lost this vote, that would be the end of uh, Ian Duncan Smith as a Conservative Party leader. Um, and then it would be up to uh, uh, Tory MPs to put their names forward. Um, now, uh, there is some discussion as to what should be the closing date of nominations. Uh, earlier they thought it would be tomorrow, uh, but it could be uh, uh, Thursday next week. Um, and uh, we expect a number of names to come forward. They will have to, MPs, Tory MPs, have to whittle it down to just two uh, to then see those two candidates go to the wider country. Um, there'll be a series of hustings, uh, they will make their case. Um, but there's also some pressure within the party not to have uh, that contest because the fear is that obviously it would lead to divisions, um, a debate which uh, may show uh, uh, disunity amongst the Tory party. I don't think they want this to go on much longer than they have to. Uh, but clearly uh, there are a number of people who would be interested in taking over from Ian Duncan Smith and I think, to be honest, we are expecting some sort of leadership contest. Contest. OK, Jonathan, stay with us, uh, but thanks very much for now. Let's uh, just take you to uh, another part of Westminster and show you the scene there because uh, the clock is very much uh, ticking down. Uh, it is uh, 6.41 and uh, at 6.55 we're expecting to cross to uh, uh, the room there at uh, room number 14 within the Houses of Parliament to hear Sir Michael Spicer give us this result. Uh, let us uh, bring in Professor Bob Worcester, the chairman of the pollsters, uh, Mori, who's been with us through the course of this afternoon. And, and just in terms of drama, it has been an astonishing afternoon. Well, it has been very interesting, and I think uh, we're about to see uh, an interesting result. Uh, Ian Duncan Smith's done his best, but I think the country, or at least his parliamentary party colleagues, are going to say his best is not good enough. And about a quarter of an hour until we get that final result. What future then for the Tory party, do you think? Well, the Tory party is headed for a loss, I believe, at the next general election, uh, all of the things being equal. And in politics, of course, they never are. But the mountain is too big a mountain to climb. They've only got 165 members of parliament. Uh, 166 were elected. They're down one from then, uh, from 2001. They will be looking for a uh, massive, they've got to go up to 40, 45 percent, and they haven't been over 35 for, ten, for over 10 years. Well, there you see uh, Michael Ancrum also going into uh, central office. So all the big beasts of the Tory party there going in to uh, be with Ian Duncan Smith uh, for... Yeah. this vote and that is why you see that uh, microphone there already set up because we do know that uh, Ian Duncan yeah, Smith will back. speak after the numbers are made public so uh, they're all in there as uh, we count down to this vote. Uh, Bob Worcester 
Uh, in terms of uh, a successor, we've seen a few of those people go in. Uh, do you look much further than Michael Howard? Oh, yes. Uh, I don't think by any means it's over yet. And the front runner at this point in a Tory leadership contest rarely wins. Margaret Thatcher was 20 to 1, and she went on to win. Uh, it was 16 to 1, I think, for John Major from memory. So the outsiders have a very clear record in the past of coming through the pack and ending up at the finishing line for who will be the leader of that party uh, between the members of parliament who elect the two that go forward, two out of the final three go forward to the constituencies, and then under these arcane rules that uh, came in under William Hague, uh, who ends up uh, in front, as Ian Duncan Smith did two years ago. We've heard threats today of resignations mm -hmm. from the grassroots. Do you think there is going to be fallout from removing Ian Duncan Smith if indeed that is what happens? Uh, it's not been unknown for the Conservative Party, not as uh, was put to uh, uh, the Prime Minister Day in question time, that they've been known to be running around stabbing each other in the front. And I think we're going to see some of that between now and Christmas uh, because it'll take that long to determine who will be the next leader of the Tory party. Okay, Bob Worcester, thanks very much indeed. Uh, let's uh, stay with these pictures at uh, Conservative Party Central Office. Let me just uh, also tell uh, the viewers that uh, we're expecting here within the next uh, couple of moments uh, to join a special BBC News programme with Hugh Edwards uh, to take us through this uh, vote that uh, gets uh, made public from Committee Room 14 and uh, from Michael Spicer. And then we will hear from the Tory leader himself, Ian Duncan Smith, and you saw all the big beasts of the Tory party. They too, I'm sure, will flank uh, their leader when he uh, makes his comments uh, known. So we are moments away from uh, knowing uh, the outcome for Ian Duncan Smith. Uh, it is a brutal business sometimes, politics. He's been there in the job for two years and uh, he uh, has 165 MPs who uh, have voted today and the magic number that uh, he needs is uh, 83. That would uh, secure his future in the job, but uh, most of the pundits who've watched this expect him to lose this vote. So that is the scene here as uh, we uh, prepare to join our BBC News uh, team and their special to take us through what is likely to be a fascinating result and reaction on this crucial vote for Ian Duncan Smith and the Conservative Party. And welcome back to this special edition of the Six O'Clock News. Decision day for Ian Duncan Smith as Conservative MPs vote on his future as leader. And this is the scene tonight here at Westminster. The votes have been cast. The counting is well underway. We should have a result for you, I'm told, within the next ten minutes or so. The past half hour, the Conservative leader, who will shortly discover his fate, left his flat and he was sounding rather confident. Sir, how Hi, confident Simon. are you? Good evening. You'll find out. I'm very confident. Really confident. Yeah, really, really. Well, tonight we'll bring you the vote as soon as it's declared. A simple majority will allow Mr Duncan Smith to continue as leader. Anything less will mean an immediate leadership contest. We'll have reaction and analysis from our political editor, Andrew Marr, who's been talking to Tory MPs all day about the way things are going. We'll have reaction from Vicky Young in Chingford in Essex, where Mr Duncan Smith can at least expect a good deal of sympathy as the local Tory MP. And we'll be getting reaction from other parts of the UK. Richard Bilton is in Penrith, a typical seat where the Tories need to regain some lost ground. So, within minutes, we should know. Mr Duncan Smith made what some Tory MPs say was the best speech of his career earlier this afternoon when he appealed for support to carry on as leader. It was, by all accounts, very direct, very personal and effective, but was it effective enough? Andrew Marr is at the Houses of Parliament. Over to you, Andrew. Well, Hugh, a uh, few hundred yards from where I'm standing, a few hundred years ago, they used to have public executions, and the crowd uh, was badly behaved, drunken, lascivious, overexcited. It's a little bit like that right now, up in the committee room corridor, as they're waiting for this vote to come out. The general feeling, talking to Tory MPs, is that Ian Duncan Smith hasn't made it, though he's had a respectable vote. That is all rumour, we'll know soon enough. But for him, it has been apart from anything else, emotionally an extraordinary period. In the old cliché, for Ian Duncan Smith, this really has been the longest day. 
These morning. past few weeks have been a vision of hell, he told his MPs this afternoon. A very public torment it's been in TV and radio studios. Since first light, he's been pleading for his job, warning everyone that a leadership contest could be a bloodbath, reminding them of the rising anger of the Tory party in the country. I said from the word go, let's get this decision. You know, I'm bold enough to say to my party, I'll put my job on the line, now endorse me. And I yeah, think that shows yeah. leadership, and I think that's important. But there's also a note of resignation. If defeated tonight, he told colleagues, he wouldn't part, and he'd stick around as a caretaker until they found someone else. Then midday and the next hurdle. His weekly appointment in the Commons with Tony Blair. A brave, decent performance, Friday. not sparkling, now but more fine. And yet he had to Britain suffer the cheers and jeers of mocking uh, Labour. No, Will no. my right honourable friend consider that backstabbing <laughs> becomes a criminal <laughs> offence? <laughs> a nod of wry acknowledgement from Ian Duncan Smith and an easy kick for Tony Blair. I want to admit that in the past few years that crime has gone up. <laughs> Then 2.30 and off to a committee room to speak to all the Tory MPs, assassins included. He felt a bit like a gladiator, said Ian Duncan Smith, as he squeezed past the waiting journalists. Most gladiators were killed, of course, but not all of them. He told the MPs he'd made mistakes, but he'd learned from them and that was what mattered. It was a good speech, everyone agreed, even if it didn't change many minds. It wasn't dry, dusty, prepared stuff. It was real passion. Ian Duncan Smith really believes in the job that he's doing and he wants to go on doing it. He deserves our support. Well, I'm not sure that whatever he said was going to make me change my mind anyway. I, I asked for there to be this vote because I believe that we would have a better chance of unseating the government uh, if we had a stronger leader. Meanwhile, from out in the country, ordinary Tory members who chose Ian Duncan Smith have been bombarding central office with angry letters asking what the MPs are up to. I think if there is a leadership election, then there will be a lot of concern from members of the party, from the, the grassroots of the party, about the fact that it has gone to that. They want Ian Duncan Smith to be given the opportunity to take the party through to the next general election and will not take kindly to those MPs who have, uh, who have essentially said no to the membership of the party. And yet tonight, before the MPs' decision's even been announced, campaigning for a new leader has already started. Michael Howard, one-time Home Secretary, is the favoured unity candidate. David Davis, the former Tory chairman, reckons he'd be the grassroots Tory choice. Tim Yeo might stand for the Conservative left. The two old war horses who are back at Westminster sniffing the air tonight are unlikely to run. For Kenneth Clark and Michael Portillo, the moment has already passed. And has it passed also tonight for Ian Duncan Smith? The latest word is he won't make it. But if he does, all Westminster will be pink with embarrassment. Andrew Marr, BBC News, Westminster. Andrew, um, just uh, to pick up there on some of the remarks you made about this afternoon's performance by Mr Duncan Smith over in the committee room when he appealed to his fellow MPs. Um, everyone saying it was a good performance, everyone saying he said the right things, but everyone seeming to say that they'd made their minds up anyway. I think they really had. Um, I think all the people who felt for some time that he wasn't up to it were not going to be swayed by one speech, however good. And of course, the loyalists were there already. Um, assuming that uh, we're right and that he has narrowly lost, then what we're going to see very, very shortly, uh, it, once that's announced, is he'll come out of Conservative central office, not very far away, and he will uh, concede defeat and he will promise to stay on as caretaker and he will promise that there will be no recriminations. Not, I have to say, something that will necessarily happen in the grassroots where the anger of some Tory activists about all of this has to be heard to be believed. Well, Andrew, I suppose one of the things that um, has been a feature of the past few weeks has been the fact that you've had lots of Tory MPs saying they sympathise with Mr Duncan Smith, lots of them saying they want him to carry on in the job, and yet one suspects that they will have voted uh, in a negative way today. Well, that seems to be, that's what they all think, put it that way, including people uh, who want him to stay on are shaking their heads and looking a bit gloomy. Now, maybe everybody's talking themselves into the same story. Maybe he'll surprise us all and pop out and win this. Who knows? But if he has lost, 
then the next thing that will happen here is that we'll have at least one member of his shadow cabinet, I think, coming out and announcing the candidacy and the team in place because what's been going on, it's been endless manoeuvring, people going down lists of potential supporters, people asking themselves if David Davis and Michael Howard could do a deal, could they prevent a contest, all of that talk has been gripping MPs. So it's, it's a little bit, it, it's almost unseemly frankly Hugh, it's a little bit like arguing uh, over the house and who's going to own it while Granny is still alive. Andrew, we'll talk to you in a short while, hopefully after we get the uh, vote. Let's take a time check, because we've got the, uh, the best time check in town here, of course. Um, just coming up to 54 minutes, 18.54, nearly 5 to 7. Now, we were told earlier on that we might get the result at 7, and then we were told it would be um, a bit earlier than that. So let's join Mark Mardell, our correspondent, who's on the phone in the committee corridor where Mr Duncan Smith made that appeal earlier on, and uh, he's waiting there to hear the result of the vote as announced by the chairman of the Tory backbench 1922 committee, Sir Michael Spicer. That's the voice we'll hear when we get the result. Um, Mark, I hope you're there on the line. Tell us what's going on. Well, this narrow, long committee is absolutely filled with people. It's fuller than a London tube train in Russia, but it's also a good deal noisier. Everybody chatting, gossiping, trying to work out what's exactly happened. The MPs haven't been let into the room as yet, so I presume that unless the announcement is going to be made uh, without them in there, that they have to be let in first. But certainly they've been locked out of committee room 14, overlooked by a rather a stern a former a portrait of a stern former Prime Minister, Conservative Prime Minister Stanley Baldwin, staring down on them. But it's uh, a lot of MPs trying to still squeeze their way up as they come up from the uh, House of Commons and out from the bars and tea rooms, trying to squeeze through the crowd to get the best possible uh, view and uh, be able to hear what's going on. But um, earlier on, it's quite a jovial atmosphere here, really. It's a bit more serious now. But uh, quite a lot of joshing the MPs as they, uh, they went in. One well-known rebel posed almost on the door before he went into vote saying oh i can't make up my mind what to do now and uh, you know quite a sort of almost um, gallows humor i suppose about it well mark um it's the age-old question uh, what's the mood you've just said it was jovial it's rather more serious now what else have people been saying during the afternoon and uh, as the hour for the vote approaches what have they been saying to you well i think i can tell you that as far as the uh, the whips the party managers are concerned they believe that all Tory MPs have voted. Now, it's a rather odd thing to say they believe. The reason is because there's one or two, two or three, in fact, names missing from their list. They think that those people have actually, in fact, voted by proxy, but they were still uh, checking that last time I spoke to them. But it looks like, looks pretty much like 100% turnout. Whatever, what else were they saying? Well, I think everybody, both journalists and politicians, you know, hate making predictions when they're hours away, let alone minutes away. But I'll tell you what people have been saying to me, that... Those on the Ian Duncan Smith camp reckon some of them that he's got around a 60 vote. Others are saying still he's won, he can do it. Uh, those on the other camp uh, reckon a little bit higher. Uh, they, they're saying about uh, 67 votes. I mean, that's well short of the 83 that he needs. But of course, they don't know. They're guessing, they're interpreting what their colleagues say. And uh, you know, people here don't always tell you the truth or necessarily have the courage of their convictions. But that's the sort of talk that's going around here. Mark, what's your hunch at the moment, and uh, from what you can see there, um, are they making their way in yet, or do you think that we've got a few more minutes to wait? It seems to me there's a few more minutes. Now, whenever I say that sort of thing on air, um, immediately the result comes. But they certainly haven't been let in. Um, there are a row of loud speakers outside the committee room, so I'm hoping we're going to hear at least a bit of radio noise before... Uh, they actually make the announcement, even if the MPs are hoping to hear it in the same way by uh, staying in the, in the committee corridor. But certainly, you know, still a great hubbub of noise and gossip and nobody, no hushed silence as we're expecting a result quite yet. But I mean, certainly within the next few minutes, as long as they've done their sums all right. Well, Mark, needless to say, I want you to stay on the line. Um, because our lives depend on it. So stay with us. I've got a seasoned observer with me here. I'm delighted to say that the former party chairman, Lord Parkinson, is with me. Uh, good evening to you, Lord good Parkinson. Evening. Thank you for joining us. Um, Mark was saying that the mood was rather jovial earlier on, but surely it's not a great day for the Tories. Well, uh, I think there'll be, it's not joviality, but relief. At least we're going to know where we stand in a few minutes' time. Oh. And I think the last few days have been a nightmare. So 
the fact that uh, we're near to the point of decision is, I think, a relief to everyone. Can I ask you a pointed question? If you'd had a vote today, which way would you have gone? I'd have voted for Ian Duncan Smith. Uh, he was uh, on the short list chosen by the members of parliament. He was endorsed by an overwhelming vote in the country. And I think, uh, as our first elected leader, he deserved a longer run at the job than the parliamentary party has given him. And I think they might pay quite a heavy price with the party in the country. Well, he was making a point that lots of people might sympathise with, which is that for all leaders there is a period of running in and learning the job and inevitably making some mistakes. Um, clearly, they're, they're, they're not too tolerant of that message. Well, you know, I remember one of the disadvantages or advantages of getting older is I remember when Ted Heath was the leader of the opposition and the party used to say at every party conference, Lord Parkinson, we'll go straight to the committee corridor. Let's go straight up. They voted 75 in favour of Mr Duncan Smith's leadership of the party. They voted 90 as not confident in his leadership. I therefore announce that the motion of confidence has been defeated. By terms of our rules, Mr Duncan Smith must now resign as leader of the Conservative Party. I therefore announce that an election will take place for a new leader. The rules state that nominations of the position for leader must close at noon on Thursday the date for closure of nominations will be Thursday the 6th of November. According to our rules, this means that the date of the first ballot will be Tuesday the 11th of November. The meeting is closed. Well done, Michael. The voice of uh, Sir Michael Spicer, chairman of the 1922 committee, declaring that uh, Ian Duncan Smith has lost his vote of confidence and will no longer be leader of the Conservative Party. Um, and that this therefore, of course, triggers a leadership election. Let's go straight to our political editor, Andrew Marr, who's uh, at the Houses of Parliament. Um, Andrew, uh, 75, a pretty respectable vote, but he loses nonetheless. He was not humiliated, as a lot of people said he was going to be, but he is clearly out. You know, Margaret Thatcher, John Major, William Hague, and now Ian Duncan Smith. This is starting to look like a habit inside the Conservative Party and they really have to hope that whatever they do now they get somebody they can stick with for some period of time because this result will deeply anger and depress a lot of Tories in the country who voted for Ian Duncan Smith. It's a very sad end uh, to his leadership. This was a man who actually expanded uh, the Tory thinking on policy in ways that his critics never believed he was capable of doing who managed to stop the Tory party tearing itself apart over Europe, as lots of people thought they were going to, and who was much more socially inclusive in terms of having uh, gay and black candidates standing for the Tory party, despite his kind of rather starchy military image. He did his level best. As far as the Conservative MPs tonight have been concerned, it wasn't enough. And now a leadership contest, Andrew, which inevitably um, will be rather brutal. Lots of Tory MPs are praying they don't have to go through a full leadership contest. They've been trying to stitch up some kind of deal between Michael Howard and David Davis and maybe some other people so that they can go to the Tory party in the country and say, listen, we're really sorry about the IDS business, but we now do have a team that we're all united behind. Can you just endorse that? I don't think it's going to work. I think there are too many people inside the Conservative Party here who think they could be leader. David Davis feels that if he can get uh, out of the, the voting at Westminster to the party in the country, he could win it for himself. He hasn't seemed inclined over the last few hours uh, to bow his head uh, to Michael Howard. Um, those discussions have been going on all the time, however. Um, the real problem, I think, is that whoever wins here is going to have to reassure a party in the country which feels bruised and angry and highly suspicious of the way the MPs are going to behave. It's not going to be an easy party to lead. The only thing that they can hope for is that with perhaps only 12, 18 months to go before a general election, even the Conservative Party at its uh, Westminster uh, height understands that they really, really have to stop doing this and they have to learn a little bit of loyalty. Andrew, for now, thank you very much. If you've just joined us, this is a special edition of the 6 o'clock news to cover the vote of confidence in Ian Duncan Smith, the Conservative leader. He's lost that vote. He will no longer be leader of the Conservative Party and leader of the opposition. Let me just remind you what the numbers were because uh, it was a little unclear when we got the, the line through from the Commons. 75 in favour 
and 90 uh, not in favour of uh, declaring confidence in Ian Duncan Smith as leader. So he lost the vote, but it must be said, as Andrew was saying, that that vote is rather more respectable than lots of people had predicted. Lord Parkinson is still with me, the former chairman. Uh, your response to the vote, Lord Parkinson? Well, I'm very sorry. I'm very sorry that Ian lost that vote because it does mean we now go in for a leadership contest. But the leadership contest, people keep saying, take, could take three months. There is no reason at all why it shouldn't be over, done and dusted within five weeks if people get to work immediately. And so I don't think it need be a too prolonged uh, process. And I just looked up in the Lord's Library this afternoon. Ted Heath announced he was going to have a leadership election and Margaret Thatcher was elected two and a half months later. So the idea that we've always had short, sharp leadership indeed. campaigns in the past is simply not true. And Lord this Parkinson. one need not be long. Thank you very much indeed Pleasure. for that. Now we mentioned the fact that uh, Chingford is Mr Duncan Smith's constituency. As I understand it, we're about to get a response from Chingford tonight from uh, the uh, constituency chairman there to this evening's result. Over to Chingford now. Yes, Hugh, as you can imagine here, there's an awful lot of affection and admiration for Ian Duncan Smith here in his own backyard. They really did feel up to the last moment that he could win through today. That hasn't been the case. I'm joined by members of the party and by the chairman of the constituency party, Coralie Buckmaster, who's going to give us her reaction to that. The officers and members of Chingford and Woodford Green Conservative Association are deeply disappointed to hear that Ian's parliamentary colleagues have removed him as leader of the party. The new leader will have to follow in the footsteps of someone who has united the party over Europe, taken the party from 20 points behind in the polls to parity or better, and made us the largest party in local government. The dignity and resolve Ian has shown during this difficult time have been an illustration of his great strength of character, as well as being in marked contrast to the cowardly behavior of his detractors who have sniped from the shadows. Ian continues as our Member of Parliament and has our complete and utter respect and trust. Both he and Betsy have our sympathy and best wishes. And can I just ask you very briefly, it's a very difficult time for Ian Duncan Smith and his wife. How do you think, you know him very well, how do you think he's feeling at this moment? I should imagine he's feeling, as we do, desperately disappointed, but he it will not uh, do anything against his resolve to carry on as Member of Parliament for this Conservative Association. He is, in fact, a very confident and determined man. He will carry on, as he has always done. And do you feel there's a problem now with the grassroots of the Conservative Party? No, I don't. No, I don't. I have to say this quite firmly, that there is overwhelming support for Ian, not just here in his own constituency, which is absolutely true, but also throughout the country. I spoke to a number of association chairmen and members at the recent conference, and they were overly, overwhelmingly okay. confident. We'll leave it there. That's the reaction here from Chingford. <clears throat> Let's go straight to Conservative Central Office, where I believe people are about to make a statement. And uh, there we can see the scene. Uh, Michael Ancrum, Deputy Leader, Theresa May, the Conservative Chairman, all waiting for a statement, uh, I would have thought, by Mr Duncan Smith himself, um, responding to tonight's news. Mr Duncan Smith, I'm told, will be out any minute. Um, and by the way, watching these pictures with me is a former chairman, another former chairman, Sir Norman Fowler this time, who's jumped into Lord Parkinson's seat. As we watch these pictures, Sir Norman, uh, your thoughts on this evening's events? Well, I think that um, he made a very good speech. I was at the 22 committee. He made a very, very good speech uh, this evening. I, he, he's earned a lot of admiration, not just from the people who supported him, but I actually I think the process had gone too far. It, it, it had really gone too far, and I think it's the right decision. Sir Norman, uh, here's Mr Duncan Smith to make his statement. Well, good evening. We've had a lot of words over the last few days, and uh, I have to tell you, now is not the time for many more. The Parliamentary Party has spoken, the announcement has been made, and I will stand down as leader uh, when a successor has finally been chosen. I will give that leader my absolute loyalty and support, whoever it is. I will not publicly choose, however, between the candidates in this forthcoming election. But I am going to defend with vigour the policies that my Shadow Cabinet and I have developed over the last two years. Although I will not 
now be the Prime Minister of the first Conservative government of the 21st century. I believe I have provided a serious and strong policy agenda for that government. A policy agenda designed by all of us to improve the quality of life for everyone in our country. To give better schools, better health care, safer streets, security in retirement and value for taxpayers' money. Key themes that have been advanced throughout that policy making process. I'm particularly sorry that I will not have the opportunity to fulfill my promise uh, to the people in some of the poorest communities that I have visited up and down the land, but I will not cease to be their champion for them and loyally from the back benches. I will fight for them for social justice throughout my time in Parliament. My deepest thanks uh, to my colleagues in the Shadow Cabinet and my front bench team, many of who go unsung, my parliamentary colleagues and of course all the staff of central office who work untiringly, unceasingly, often without the thanks that they deserve. And most of all, most of all, to the voluntary party whose hard work and dedication puts all of us here into this House of Commons and enabled me to become this party's first fully elected leader. But may I say, most of all my thanks to Betsy and my family, whose support in the last two years has been unfailing. It has been an immense honour to lead this great party and to be first, the first fully elected leader by the voluntary party and by the full membership. I profoundly hope that the next leader to be elected in this manner will also be the next Prime Minister. Thank you very much indeed. Ian Duncan Smith, a typically uh, dignified and measured statement by him, responding to what must be a bitter blow, um, losing his vote of confidence tonight by 90 votes to 75. You're watching a special edition of the 6 o'clock news following today's dramatic events at Westminster. The former Conservative chairman, Sir Norman Fowler, is with me here. Um, very dignified and measured. He must be a bitterly disappointed man. Yes, it's, I mean, it's altogether typical of the man. I mean, a very decent and a very honourable response and everything that you would expect. I think the lesson of this now is it was a very close result, actually. And obviously it does show a division uh, in the party. And what is absolutely crucial now is that we have a candidate taking us forward as leader who is capable of uniting the Conservative Party. That is the number one requirement. I'm just told, Sir Norman, by the way, that uh, David Davis, who is a very prominent Conservative, of course, hotly tipped by many as a future, potentially a future leader. He is making a statement apparently later this evening at about a quarter to eight. Um, would your support be for a leader, a leader of his kind of stamp or for somebody else? Well, my support would be for a leader, first of all, who's capable of uniting the party, and people are going to make a judgment on that, but also a leader with experience. I mean, even with William Hague, I mean, William was brilliant, but it was too early. With Ian, I think, in a sense, you could actually argue that it was too early. We do need a leader of experience who is able to hold his own in the House of Commons, but is also able to organise um, uh, the Conservative Party, which would is a big organisation. Who would that be? Well, I think the obvious frontrunner at the moment is, uh, is Michael Howard, who has, if I can say this, because he took over from me when I handed over to him and uh, uh, the Secretary of State for Employment. He also uh, served with me um, in the shadow uh, cabinet when I was the chairman of the party. He was a really good player. He didn't go out and brief against the, uh, against the government or against the party. Sir Norman, um, once again, thank you for joining us. Thank you. Now my colleague John Sopel is on College Green, which is the traditional venue, of course, for lots of talk during these uh, dramatic events at Westminster. John, I think, has some guests with him. Over to you, John. Hugh, thank you very much indeed. Yes, another year, another Tory leadership contest, and the grass tends to turn to mud as MPs flood here to give their instant reactions to what has happened. Let me talk now to Charles Hendry, uh, Angela Browning, uh, both MPs, and Ed Vasey, who hopes to become an MP. Charles Hendry, you were part of Ian Duncan Smith's campaign team. Your reaction to this vote? It's disappointing, I'm very sad, but I think it does vindicate Ian's decision to stand, because whilst he's lost, he certainly hasn't been humiliated. We're being told yesterday he'll be lucky to get 21 votes. But well, you were saying you could win, and he hasn't. And we, we hoped he could win. We hoped, thought he might, and that in the end he hasn't. The party's spoken, and it's crucial that the leader of the party carries the majority of 
MPs behind them. So what happens now? Who will you be backing to become leader? It's too early to say. We don't know who the candidates are. but You've there got are a pretty good idea. Yes, I think we've got a pretty good idea. You've got people like Michael Howard, who's one of the biggest, most effective campaigners in the parliamentary party. People like Michael Ancrum, who's extraordinarily popular around the country with, with the membership. But there are strong candidates there who I think can give a good presence for the party. A Angela Browning, you're a vice chairman of the party, which means you have very strong links with the people in the country. What will they be feeling tonight? Sick, fed up, angry with you all? Well, I suspect their feelings are very mixed because obviously they were the people who elected Ian as the leader. And uh, as Charles has said, I think he's totally vindicated in standing today because it's disappointing he didn't win. But the vote itself, 75 votes of the parliamentary party, will show the people out in the, out in the constituencies that he, he, he was somebody who was respected within the parliamentary party. What, with 90 over half the MPs voting against him to kick him out? Well, we had to bring a close, as he himself said, to what was going on in the last few weeks. And okay. I know the people in the country particularly wanted closure on that. Ed Vasey, I, mean, I don't know whether you can see behind me, but you can see uh, David Davis, who's going off now to make a statement uh, to the House of Commons. Let me just move out the way. And he is apparently making a statement which will be his intentions, presumably, uh, to stand for the leadership. I'm just trying to get out of the way of the camera and the flash bulbs popping on what David Davis hopes will be his night of destiny. I just want to get one more reaction as David Davis uh, disappears towards the St Stephen's entrance of the House of Commons. Ed Vaser, you hope to become an MP. Who do you hope your leader will be? Well, off we go again. I hope that the Parliamentary Party chooses one leader. I hope it'll be Michael Howard. And do you think he can unite the party and yes, appeal to the I country? Yes, I do. I think he's got the experience necessary. I don't think he's part of any faction. I think he's done a brilliant job of Shadow Chancellor. He's been utterly loyal to Ian Duncan Smith. I suspect he voted for him tonight. He's never sought office after 97 when he lost that leadership. And I think he should be... I think activists just don't want one of these prolonged leadership contests. We've already seen it kick off now with this kind of march, to one candidate off to march, declare himself. We don't want any of that. We just want a, a new leader as quickly as uh, possible so we can get this okay, party all united. of you, thank you very much indeed. Now back to Hugh in the studio. Hugh. John, many thanks. We'll be back for more reaction, of course, as it happens. Just to confirm, if you've just joined us, it's a special edition of the 6 o'clock news. Ian Duncan Smith has lost the vote of confidence uh, among Tory MPs. It was a pretty decent vote he got, 75 votes, but uh, there were 90 votes uh, declaring no confidence in him. So he's lost. He will no longer be leader of the party. There will be a leadership contest. That's the update for you. And we already know, and John was pointing him out just now, David Davis, who is one of the prominent Tory MPs, has been named as a potential leader. He is on his way over to the House of Commons right now, and he's expected to declare uh, his candidacy in about half an hour's time. I'm sure we'll have uh, a similar declarations from people like Michael Howard as well. Now, um, as far as Ian Duncan Smith is concerned, he'll hang on and uh, look after the party until a new leader is elected. He told us that a short while ago. And I suppose that when people look at his uh, leadership, they will recognise that he brought forward lots of radical new policies. There were, unfortunately for him, consistent questions, of course, about the quality of his leadership. Sean Lay has this assessment. Do not underestimate the determination of a quiet man. Low-key but straightforward, the virtues his supporters claimed for Ian Duncan Smith. They thought it a vote-winning contrast to a Prime Minister who sometimes seemed too polished. His unspun style appealed to grassroots Tories. They made him leader. He was their man, never really part of the Conservative establishment. The laws to the left! A decade ago, he was at the heart of parliamentary rebellions against his own government on Europe. The young Duncan Smith was a rebel backbencher with a cause. He was brave and tenacious and true to himself. And it pays in politics to be true to yourself. But as leader, he learned to compromise, ending division over Europe, teaching the party to focus on public services, visiting areas which for years have been Tory-free zones. Outside Party HQ, it was all smiles, but a series of rows within led to the departure of a number of senior officials. A year ago, as unease over his leadership grew, he issued a dramatic warning to his party opponents. My message is simple and stark. Unite or die. A former soldier himself, he won the gratitude of the Prime Minister for supporting the war in Iraq. But in their weekly parliamentary jousts, Mr Duncan Smith struggled with his voice. First asylum seekers, and now he wants them all kept in the same place. <coughs> he wanted a democratic House of Lords... Ahead of last month's party conference, expert help was sought to help him relax and project his own personality. 
He was a very good listener and he would listen to advice from a team around him and make his own mind up, which is exactly what a leader should do. And what's interesting is the difference between the man you see on the screen and the man you meet in real life. That difference became less and less as time went on. The quiet man is here to stay and he's turning up the volume. They clapped and they clapped, but the speech intended to silence his critics instead fueled the discontent, which has tonight ended Ian Duncan Smith's leadership. Sean Lay, BBC News. Sean Lay with that assessment of Mr Duncan Smith's uh, two-year leadership. Now, don't let it be said that uh, we haven't got any excitement for you this evening. We've had the excitement of the vote. Um, and we showed David Davis, one of those prominent campaigners, as we thought, making his way over to St Stephen's. Well, is he going to stand? That's the question, because there are lots of rumours going around now in the past few minutes. Let's join Andrew Marr, our political editor, and ask Andy, what's going on? Well, there's a rumour ricocheting around here with the speed of a bullet at the moment, I have to say to you that David Davis will in fact announce that he has come to uh, an agreement with Michael Howard who's going to support Michael Howard and won't be standing. We've got no confirmation of that. We will hear whether that's the case. But there have certainly been very, very detailed and intensive conversations between the Davis and the Howard camp trying to see if they can put together uh, the Tory equivalent, if you like, of a government of national unity or an alliance uh, embracing uh, different wings of the party. They're both right-wingers, of course, um, but if they could get the support of other figures, uh, then that would be great. Now, I'm joined by Crispin Blunt, who six months ago, Crispin, 1st of May, fired the first shot. You were over the trench saying Ian Duncan Smith has got to go. Then nobody followed you. Now. 90-odd MPs uh, have agreed with you. What's changed? Well, I think uh, it was actually foreseeable in May that this issue had to be addressed. Um, and in the only way it could be addressed in a vote of confidence, either to shore up Ian's position um, or to get on with the process of choosing a new leader. And uh, I think it's, it's regrettable that it's taken six months, but it has. And although tonight is a sad and serious night for Ian, and one thinks, of course, of his friends and his family who've supported him, and the dignified way in which he's carried himself both mm. today and over the last few days does him enormous credit, um, as one would expect, of a, of a former Guards officer, of course. Um, but uh, what tonight has shown is that the party's serious about getting back into power. And do you think that seriousness would be underlined if they were able, indeed, to stitch together some sort of uh, agreement between leading contenders rather than going through uh, a cantankerous and difficult and unpredictable election? Well, the obvious answer to that is yes. And I think people should not underestimate the determination now of the Conservative Party to put itself in the best possible shape to win the next general election. And obviously any arrangement like that would be huge, hugely welcome uh, to the Conservatives in the country. Um, people from across the political spectrum have been very, very anxious that we should start proving ourselves the most effective right. opposition to the government. Crispin, thank you very much. Andy Marr there with Crispin Blunt, Mr Duncan Smith, leaving central office for the last time as leader. Well, he's no longer leader, really, is he? He's just caretaker leader, but uh, uh, it's his last official visit there as leader. And um, lots of applause and lots of sadness there, obviously, among his officials at central office. We've talked about the leadership challenge, but of course, the Tory party still faces the huge challenge of trying to stop the Labour Party winning uh, possibly a third term in office after the next election. So, Laura Trevelyan has been looking at what lies ahead for the party right now. Take a look at the average Conservative Party member. This was the scene at the Blackpool conference just a few weeks ago. The party is getting older and its support is concentrated in the south of the country. The Tories have an electoral mountain to climb if they're to regain power. Their basic problem is that the world has really moved on and the Conservative Party hasn't. Uh, and I don't think it really matters at this stage whether the Conservatives elect uh, one person who may be vying for the leadership or another. That's not really the problem. The problem is for the Conservative Party working out that they have to be in a position to capitalise on voters becoming increasingly dissatisfied with Labour. That's what Tories here in Beaconsfield, a safe Conservative seat, are longing to do. But first they say there's got to be an end to the infighting. I think loyalty is the key here. We unite. I think as a priority, we have to unite. We've got to be a much more attractive, much more all-inclusive party. So, um, Adam Afriye shows the party's stop, so beginning yeah. to respond to that message. He's been selected to stand in true blue Windsor at the next election. 
Some of the new candidates that are coming through, that are soon to be in the House, will therefore reflect a more modern view of the party, a more modern view of the Conservative Party overall. Some progress on selection then, but there's still the policies. Ian Duncan Smith's pledge to abolish student fees was eye-catching and popular. But overall, say experts, the Tory message is confused. The electorate will need to be convinced, as they were for Labour in 1997, that the sums add up. And I think for the time being, although the Conservatives have got a lift out of some of their new policies, in the end they'll need to demonstrate how you really can get better public services and tax cuts at the same time. Getting this man out of Downing Street is what the Conservatives desperately want to do. Once they've stopped fighting themselves, they can concentrate on taking the battle to Tony Blair. Laura Trevelyan, BBC News. Well now, uh, all eyes tonight probably will be on one man in particular, Michael Howard, the former Home Secretary, now Shadow Chancellor, been talked about by Lord Fowler, my guest, and other people as uh, probably the uh, hot contender of the moment. His seat is in Folkestone. Uh, that's where his political power base is. Philippa Thomas is there uh, this evening. Philippa, any word locally on what he might or might not do? No word yet, Hugh, but we are, of course, all on tenterhooks. And, of course, people here have been talking with pride about their man, the man who could soon uh, become leader of the opposition. However, I have to say, the first reaction was not one of jubilation that uh, Michael Howard might now somehow sweep in, but it was one of sadness, because there's a very strong feeling here that the grassroots have been ignored, that IDS was, as he said just now, the first fully elected Tory leader. And so the very first reaction almost was, well, what about the voice of the ordinary party members. Beyond that, of course, beyond that initial loyalty, of course, they're going for their man, Mr Howard. Philippa, one interesting thing, just to put you before we leave, which is that um, Mr Howard, of course, a few years ago was seen as, how can I put this, a rather unfashionable figure after the major years. Uh, but now suddenly, and certainly local people would agree with this, I take, that um, he's, um, he's reinvented himself. Well, it's interesting, isn't it, because the, the public image of, uh, of Michael Howard is one of quite a, a hard man, a tough guy. Certainly, he can cut it at the dispatch box, uh, but is he actually somebody who could charm the voters as well? Now, talking to people here, they say one of the things that has kept him in this constituency for 21 years is the fact that he wins over people who aren't natural conservatives. He's very good. He loves going out on the doorstep, going canvassing, got a lot of energy, loves actually meeting people in the street. He's not a remote figure at all and so what they're obviously hoping here his backers is that something of the charm they know can be transmitted to the the wider screen to the party but to the public at large should mr howard stand and should he become the leader of the conservative party philippa in folkestone thank you very much for that let's take a time check here at uh, westminster this special edition of the six o'clock news it's just turned 25 past seven dramatic night where ian duncan smith uh, has lost the vote of confidence of Tory MPs. Let's look at the figures once again. If you've just joined us, a reminder for you, 75 Tory MPs said they did have confidence in Mr Duncan Smith as leader. Um, that was uh, beaten, though, by 90 of them who clearly did not have confidence and, and voted in that, uh, in that way too. So he's, he's off and his leadership is at an end. Um, and as for now, uh, we can remind ourselves of what uh, Mr Duncan Smith had to say for himself in a statement that he made outside Conservative Central Office just a few moments ago. Although I will not now be the Prime Minister of the first Conservative government of the 21st century, I believe I have provided a serious and strong policy agenda for that government. A policy agenda designed by all of us to improve the quality of life for everyone in our country. Mr Duncan Smith speaking a short while ago. Well, let's try to draw some of these strands together and um, hopefully talk once again to our political editor, Andrew Marr, uh, who's at the Houses of Parliament. Um, Andrew, I know you've been talking to other people in the meantime after your chat with Crispin Blunt. How do you see things shaping up now? Well, um, there's a series of uh, members of the Shadow Cabinet going to come out uh, over the next 40 minutes to an hour uh, and make different statements. We don't really know whether we're about to see the beginnings of a very, very bloody campaign between different people, or indeed whether the big beasts of the Conservative Party, moderately sized beasts these days, have actually come to an agreement between themselves and are going to try and present the Conservative Party in the country um, with a sort of agreed solution. There's an awful lot of Tory MPs bloodied, 
embarrassed, in some cases even humiliated, uh, by the events and the headlines of the last few weeks and months, who would dearly love to be able to say, at last we've sorted it, we've got Michael Howard, and we've got everybody else gathered around him, and we're going to go forward together. But never underestimate, Hugh, as you know very well, the power of ego in politics. There's an awful lot of people who think to themselves, maybe, this is my chance to become Conservative leader, and who knows, things could go wrong for Tony Blair, and I could suddenly find myself in number 10. Andrew, thank you very much indeed for that. And that's it. We've come to the end of this special edition of the Six O'Clock News, the day Ian Duncan Smith lost the vote of confidence and lost the right to carry on as Conservative leader. There'll be more on News 24, of course, during the evening, and there'll be full analysis on the 10 o'clock news with me here on BBC One. But from all of us here at Westminster on a momentous evening, thank you for watching and goodbye for now. Good evening and welcome to yet another dramatic day here at Westminster where the turmoil in the Conservative Party has come to a fore once again where for the fourth time in eight years the Conservative Party is looking for a new leader of the party. Tonight Ian Duncan Smith failed to gain sufficient votes. He gained 75 votes. It was a lot closer than people had expected. But 90 Conservative MPs have voted for a new leader. Shortly after the result was declared, Ian Duncan Smith came out of Conservative Central Office to give his first reaction to the result. The Parliamentary Party has spoken, the announcement has been made, and I will stand down as leader uh, when a successor has finally been chosen. I will give that leader my absolute loyalty and support, whoever it is. I will not publicly choose, however, between the candidates in this forthcoming election. But I am going to defend with vigour the policies that my shadow cabinet and I have developed over the last two years. Although I will not now be the Prime Minister of the first Conservative government of the 21st century, I believe I have provided a serious and strong policy agenda for that government. Ian Duncan Smith speaking outside Conservative Central Office. We're hoping that we're going to hear from David Davis, someone who's been tipped as a possible leadership candidate. He's due to be saying something in the next few minutes. Of course, on News 24, we'll bring you that live. But let me talk now to Tim Collins, a shadow cabinet member in Ian Duncan Smith's shadow cabinet. First of all, your reaction to the result? Very sad. I think Ian Duncan Smith, in the clip that you've just heard, has left the leadership with the dignity and the grace that he brought to it in the two years that he was allowed to lead the party. Won't history judge that he just simply wasn't up to it? I don't think history will judge that, to be honest. We did very well in the local elections, but there's no point refighting a battle which sadly now has been lost. I do regret the decision that's been taken, but there's no going back on it. Now, as Conservatives, we actually have to demonstrate we are prepared to unite and be led by anybody. <laughs> you say anybody with a sort of almost a hint of desperation. No, what I mean is that I hope we will come up with a very good new leader. I'm sure we will. But the challenge now, I think, is for the party to demonstrate it's prepared to be led, not so much for a new leader to emerge who's got entirely different leadership skills. Well, well uh, I mean, I'm going to ask you the question, and I bet you're not going to ask it. Answer. Who do you want to be the new leader? I'm not going to answer it yet for the very simple reason that, as far as I know, at least no one has declared themselves as a candidate for leadership at the moment. Well, of the potential candidates around, who takes your fancy? <laughs> well, there are a number of very good people, but I don't actually think now, literally minutes after Ian Duncan Smith has lost a vote of confidence, I should be starting to endorse people. OK, you don't, want, you don't want to endorse somebody, but what about the whole idea that there should be some kind of coronation, that somehow the Tory party comes together almost anoints a leader so that there doesn't have to be a contest, it doesn't have to drag on and on while Labour's lead in the polls presumably just soars. Well, something that brings the party together has got to be a good thing. Now, I know that many activists in the country who did, after all, elect Ian Duncan Smith by a 61% margin will feel that they ought to be consulted. But I also know that a lot of people want the party to put its divisions behind it. If there is one outstanding leader behind whom the whole parliamentary party can unite, that has to be a good thing. Do you think it's possible? I think it is possible. It will depend on negotiations and discussions which couldn't properly start until a few minutes ago. So it's conceivable that there could be a dream ticket involving, I don't know, Michael Howard, David Davis, Michael Ancrum? 
There's possible uh, combinations that uh, no doubt will be bruited about in the newspapers for the next few days. My priority, I think, now is to say to a party in the country, which I suspect will feel very bruised, very hurt, very left out, that the parliamentary party now do recognise, I believe, most of them anyway, that we have a duty to them to unite now. Yeah, I was just going to ask you that. What do you think the mood is in the country? among the people who tirelessly organise the fundraising, deliver the leaflets and all the rest of it that goes with running a voluntary party? If we're candid, and now that the election is over, I'll be candid in saying to you the party in the country has not been wholly united behind Ian, but I do believe the vast majority of them wanted him to continue. That is not an option anymore under the rules. I regret that, but that is the fact. What they now need to feel is that the parliamentary party will stop squabbling amongst itself and will concentrate on our real job, which is opposing the government. I, I don't want to sound cynical, but I've heard that standing sure on this have. college green sure for many have. years. I'm sure you have. What we need to do now is unite behind our leader. Yeah. It's been a mantra since, I don't know, 1990. Yeah. When, uh, and, it was, and it was true then, John, and it's been true for every leader since, and I reckon this is just about our last chance actually to do it. You're quite right. Mouthing the words isn't good enough anymore. We've actually got to do it. How easy will it be? It's not going to be that easy, but if there's one small, tiny glimmer of light, it is that we're now 18 months away from a general election. And even those of my colleagues whose behaviour recently I haven't necessarily been very happy with, I think do recognise we can't possibly do other than unite behind the new leader, whoever that is, in the run-up to a general election. OK, Tim Collins, thanks very much indeed. Let me just introduce a couple of my other guests that we've got here on College Green, this famous patch of turf, which at times of leadership contests becomes almost a sort of magnet uh, for the the nation as everyone gathers here to hear what people have got to say and express views. Michael Fabricant and Ted, Sir Teddy Taylor have joined me now. Uh, Michael Fabricant, first of all, what do you make of this evening's events? Well, I agree very much with what Tim Collins has had to say. It's been a sad day, actually, and quite an emotional day. I mean, a number of my colleagues have broken down in tears, and I felt pretty close to it myself. One thing I do think we must do, in addition to all the things that Tim said, I think we've really got to revise these rules. Because one of the problems is by having the party as a whole make the final decision, it makes it very difficult for a leader to enjoy 51% of the support of the parliamentary party. And I think while it was absolutely right to enfranchise the 350,000 members of the Conservative Party nationwide, I think possibly the rules should be turned around so that we find that they can make the choice first and maybe leave three members of Parliament, three potential leaders, whom then the members of Parliament can decide upon. Is there, a, I mean, Tim Collins was talking earlier about how desirable it would be if there could be some kind of uh, unity candidate emerge. Won't the party think it's some kind of dodgy fudge cooked up here at Westminster? Anything would be better than the two months that we're now going to face. We're probably going to have to go through it. It's going to mean that we won't be able to provide real opposition to a government that's discredited. You know, your colleague Andy Marr said something about three weeks ago, and he said, you know, it's an incredible situation when you have a government which is unpopular and discredited, yet can still be so confident of winning the next general election. Now, this can't be allowed to go on. If we can come up with some sort of dream ticket, I for one, and I think the party as a whole, will be very relieved. So, Teddy Taylor, you've been uh, round the course a few times on these occasions. What do you make of tonight? I can only really say I'm absolutely sick by what's happened tonight because I've been here for 40 years. I think Ian's one of the straightest, most honourable people I've come across in politics. And to have him rejected for reasons I can't understand. I've been involved with troubles in the party before I resigned from Ted Heath's government over the EC. But we remain the best of friends. What we've seen is a devious, horrible, nasty campaign basically to just discredit him. And I think it's a scandalous thing. Now, I personally think we've made a horrible mistake tonight because I think the people of Britain are getting sick to death with politics. You see this with the reducing numbers of people taking part. They're fed up with spin. They're fed up with people going on television and saying things which aren't true. What they were looking for was someone who was honourable, decent, and someone who'd tell the truth. We had that in Ian, and I think they've made a terrible mistake in throwing him out. People say, we'll find another leader, but quite frankly, it's not so easy. You might find someone like the chaps in the present government who go on television and do well. People get sick of that after a while. And what they were looking for was a honourable person. And I think we've made a horrible mistake, which we'll live to regret. Well, you've made the mistake now. Who next? Well, 
as Tim said, I mean, who next indeed? A, we don't know who's standing. Well, you do Got pretty a, well. Well, we don't. I mean, there's going to be a statement from David Davis. There's all sorts of rumours about what that's going to be about. <laughs> I mean, I do hope, I just pray, that we can get this two-month process over with pretty quickly. But uh, I totally agree with what Teddy said. I think it's been despicable what has happened over the last few weeks. Uh, we had a party conference with, for the first time, really good, exciting policies, which even, even the Guardian newspaper said were attractive. And yet, you know, there were noises off. And it was a deliberate policy to destabilise the leadership. But look, we've got to put that behind yeah, us I'm, and we've got I'm, to move I, on. I want, I want to talk Turkey here. Right, Michael Howard. Do you fancy him as leader? Listen. We have got a lot of able people. I like Michael Howard, I like David Davis, I like Tim Yeo, whom I work for. I'm a, staff, I'm a, a, a trade and industry shadow minister. And of course, Michael Ancrum, they're all able people. Believe it or not, I haven't even really begun to think about it. I'm Ted, still shell-shocked. Teddy Taylor, very quickly, who do you want to see as being the leader? I can't think of anyone who'd be as good. I'd want whoever we get. I just hope they will commit themselves to doing what Ian was doing, which is, in fact, sticking to telling the truth. He was a man of integrity, and whoever we get, we don't want a smart guy. We don't want someone who appears on television and does it. We want someone telling the truth. I'll look round for someone of that character, try and find him. I hope we do. And can I just say that one yeah, thing very, that I don't, I don't want to see a massive change in policy now. I don't want to see a massive change in central <coughs> office. You know, Ian's built the party up and we've got to build on that and not see a huge reversal over the next few months. OK, Michael Fabricant, Teddy Taylor, thank you very much indeed. Well, we heard Michael Fabricant talking about what should happen next at Conservative Central Office. And let's go live there now and talk to our chief political correspondent, Gitto Harry. Gitto, what is the mood there this evening? Well, the mood is sort of anxious, a bit sort of uh, depressed, but at least there's some sort of closure here. But events moving very fast, and I can cast a bit of light on some of the things you have been talking about. I can tell you, for instance, uh, John, that David Davis is definitely not going to stand for the leadership. He'll make that very, very clear in about five minutes' time. That, I must confess, was a surprise to me. He's been poised to stand for an awful long time. He's now thought about this. He senses there's a huge appetite in the party, not just in Parliament, but out there in the country, to see the party avoid a fractious contest and he decided he doesn't want to contribute to that he wants to be there he hasn't done a deal i've checked that with other people as well there's no deal there but he feels the appetite is there for a coronation he's not the man uh, to go for that uh, united leadership so he's going to stand aside there will be a press conference 8 15 tonight this is an intriguing cast list for you Liam fox oliver letwin and Stephen Dorrell. There you have different wings of the party across the board, essentially. What are they going to do if they're not going to announce that Michael Howard is standing for the leadership and has support from all quarters, then I'll be astonished, John. So what we are seeing tonight are moves in that direction because earlier this evening, I was told, watch this space, Michael Ancrum, deputy leader of the party, stood before, is poised to stand. He had a campaign team in place. He might still go for it, but literally in the last few seconds, I've been told in the light of what David Davis is about to tell us that Michael Ancrum too is reconsidering his position. So from being in a position where we had at least three candidates, we might already be moving towards one person, that person being the Shadow Chancellor, the former Home Secretary, Michael Howard. OK, Gitto, just explain this to me. Why do you think it is that David Davis, a man, an ambitious man who, you know, his supporters haven't sort of exactly hidden his talents, why do you think he is going to uh, decide against standing? Well, you could look at it uh, from uh, this perspective. Who would want to be the Tory leader that leads them into battle against Labour in the next couple of years? It's a pretty thankless job. It's a job that most people uh, believe at this stage at the very least is a job uh, that's about hammering your head against the wall and actually being the loser in an election. David Davis, um, uh, notably younger than the other three names we've had in the last few days, actually in a position perhaps to sit this one out. I think a lot of people will also be calculating that he had uh, taken his soundings and thought he couldn't actually get over that hurdle. He couldn't actually get enough people in the parliamentary party to give him a chance with the grassroots where he thinks his uh, support lies. So interesting calculations there. Uh, with me now outside uh, Conservative Central Office, Bernard Jenkin, um, one of uh, Ian Duncan Smith's closest uh, friends indeed, as well as colleagues and a uh, member of the Shadow Cabinet, uh, as it was. Just tell us about the mood of the man. We've seen him, we've heard from him. He looks upbeat, but this must be a devastating end just two years down the line. 
Well, there have been devastating moments, um, and I think probably the worst moment for him when allegations were made about his wife and family, and uh, we've had some very, very dark hours. But uh, recently, he's been very straightforward uh, about the situation. He either commands the confidence of his colleagues or he doesn't. But and it's he... a pretty depressing thing, and... two years on, to be told by your parliamentary colleagues that they don't really rate you. Well, he's had a very, very tough time. Uh, he came into the job with relative little experience. That was a risk the party took when they elected him. I'm and sorry we, we have to leave that well, because David say, Davis we... is just outside the House of Commons and we all want to know, including you, <laughs> what his intentions are. We'll go over there, live. He's just about to come out Gisele, thanks very much indeed. Let's go straight to the St Stephen's entrance where I think we can join our political editor, Andrew Maher. Andy. Well, you, you joined me, but you also joined David Davis, who's about to make his statement. Okay. Yes. David Davis uh, is just arrived. Right. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. It's a sad day today. Uh, I want to start by making a tribute to Ian Duncan Smith. He's had the most awful time in the last six weeks, and my heart goes out to his, him and his family. And he's done a great job in developing policy for our party and uh, helping unify us over, uh, over Europe. However, despite his best efforts in recent years, our party has been riven by division and faction and infighting. And this has actually stopped us doing what we're here for, which is to take the fight to Labour. Now, very recently I've had a lot of people come to me and suggest I run for the leadership. I put my name into the coming contest for the leadership. Enough to make me think I can win it. However, a long and protracted leadership contest would worsen those divisions and those faction fighting and make the sorts of problems we've had in the last few years even worse in the run-up to the next general election. Accordingly, I have decided not to run myself and to step aside in favour of the candidate who I think is best equipped to unify our party. I judge that to be Michael Howard. And I do it in the hope that we can unify, unify around a single candidate, a single leader, and help him win the next general election for the Conservative Party. Thank you. Right, well that's uh, the statement from David Davis. Um, I think it's important to em uh, it's important to emphasize, I think, here that uh, David Davis' supporters are saying they didn't come to any agreement. There was no deal done behind the scenes. He hasn't been offered a particular job, shadow chancellor or deputy leader or shadow foreign secretary or anything like that. He has decided to do this because he sees, like many other Conservative MPs, that unless there is a rallying round some leader, this party is in danger of finally disintegrating. Uh, David Davis uh, had a lot of people working for him. He had a proper and serious campaign going. And we were just beginning to get into the stages where David Davis people were starting to say pretty unpleasant things about Michael Howard. Michael Howard's people were starting to say not very pleasant things about David Davis and we could have been back into the old business of different Tory factions going for each other. The other thing that I would point out here is that David Davis and Michael Howard are separated uh, by style and by age and geography, but they're not really separated by politics. They're both on the right of the party, both share very similar views on Europe. Neither of them uh, are kind of uh, relaxed pinko liberals, far from it on social issues. Um, and so it would have been an entirely personal, an entirely ego-driven struggle if they'd been fighting each other. And I think a lot of Tory MPs will applaud David Davis for standing back. Do you think that this indicates that perhaps what we're moving towards is less of a contest than more of a coronation? Well, that's what they're trying to achieve. And I think one of the other candidates who's been wondering about taking part, Michael Ancrum, uh, may well have been looking at this and thinking, ah, I'm not absolutely sure that I want to take part either. Now, of course, what no one here can uh, factor into it is some other candidate somewhere else in the party who suddenly thinks, well, I'm going to jump in. They can't um, have everybody um, uh, stitched up at this stage, but what they will be able to do is put an enormous amount of moral and political pressure on everybody else to rally around Michael Howard. And I think we'll be seeing lots of other members of the Shadow Cabinet coming uh, out uh, in the not too distant future saying, yep, I'm a Michael Howard man, I'm a Michael Howard woman as well. Now, I hesitate to say this because this is the Conservative Party, 
but this is just beginning to look like a relatively smooth and well-managed operation. And it's an awful long time since we've been able to say that. Yeah, a Andy, I mean, the other thing that is interesting about that is how is the, the Tory party in the country going to feel? They elected Ian Duncan Smith, they've seen him uh, cast aside, and yet it looks like it may end up that they're not going to have any say in who the new leader is going to be. Well, some of them will be very angry about that. Um, I have to say, quite a lot of the people who went for Ian Duncan Smith on, in the first place did so because they liked what he was saying on Europe and they liked the fact that he was pretty dry right-winger. Well, Michael Howard uh, and David Davis are both uh, relatively similar to that position on Europe, are both pretty dry right-wingers. So I don't think anybody in the Conservative Party in the country uh, who would be worried about a lurch of policy towards the centre or the left uh, in their terms need look at this particular group of Conservative politicians and fear too much. OK, Andrew Marr at the St Stephen's entrance of the House of Commons. Thanks very much indeed. Well, we talked about what the mood would be like in the country. I should imagine one particular part of the country where it's pretty sombre uh, this evening is Chingford on the East London-Essex border, which is, of course, the power base of Ian Duncan Smith. We can go there live now to our correspondent, Nick Thatcher. Nick. John, as you can imagine, a lot of disappointment here that their man didn't win through in the end and to a certain extent, some anger as well. Let's talk to the chairwoman of the constituency association, Coralie Buckmaster. You've been speaking to Ian Duncan Smith today. You're due to speak to him again tonight. It is disappointing, but not totally unexpected. Well, to me, yes, it was unexpected because I know he has such a lot of support uh, through the associations that I've spoken to and the members in the party. I do know how much support there was out there for him and I felt he could do it. So how angry are you tonight that it, it fell to a, a number of your MPs at Westminster to decide his fate? Well, I'm, I am angry about it because malcontents like this do the party no good. It's a Conservative party we're concerned about. Can you clear the air, though? And surely some people would say tonight has cleared the air after all that speculation of recent weeks. Well, I suppose you could say that, yes, and I hope we do get on and we put ourselves back together again in a strong form because that's what we have to do. We have to go forward and do what we have to do. We have to represent the people of this country. Councillor Matt Davis from Waltham Forest Borough Council is standing next to you. Uh, Councillor Davis, I mean, surely you must be disappointed. After all, it was the grassroots, the wider party that helped elect in Duncan Smith with that overwhelming majority, and then it's your MPs that kick him out. Uh, you're right, I am disappointed. I, I, I feel that uh, the party, the wider party, has been disenfranchised by this manoeuvre on the part of the parliamentary party. Um, I think that uh, it, it also is the case that uh, the media have a lot, to, have, have had a lot to do with this, winding people up in dark corners, which are something I saw going on at party conference. Well, you personally. can't blame the media for squabbling oh. Tories. We've had squabbling Tories for years now, haven't we? Uh, there have been some squabbles, but I think when the media is as anti institutionally anti-Tory as the British media is, they dive on it. There were just as, there are more M Labour MPs would like to see the back of Tony Blair than there were Conservative ones want to see the back of Ian Duncan Smith. That just doesn't get reported. From what we're hearing tonight from our political editor, Andy Marr, uh, David Davis already said he's not running. Many others may come out and say the very same thing. Michael Howard is the name in the frame. It looks like you could, as a, a much wider party, be denied an election for your new leader. Uh, quite frankly, I don't think that a leadership election would necessarily be a helpful thing now. Um, if, if somebody with the experience, the strength and the standing within the party and the country that Michael Howard has can come forward and become our new leader without uh, giving everybody the opportunity to spend another six weeks sniping at us. That is possibly a very healthy thing, to be honest. Councillor um, Matt Davis, we'll have to leave it there. And Coralie Buckmaster, thank you very much indeed for talking to us. Some of the views from here in, uh, in Duncan Smith's own backyard is Chingford and Woodford Green constituency. Back to you, John. Nick, thank you very much indeed. Well, let's go to another highly important constituency, or a constituency that we assume will be highly important over the coming days, Folkestone. Philippa Thomas is there. Thank you very much. And I have to tell you that when we just watched David Davis say he was throwing his weight behind Michael Howard, the most almighty cheer went up here in Howard Heartland. I'm joined by the constituency chairman, David Monk. And David, uh, I could tell that you were all rejoicing at that point because it's the, maybe the main rival out of the way now. Absolutely. I don't know about the main rival, but it is certainly a rival out of the way if Michael is going to stand. Of course, we don't know yet whether Michael is going to stand. Everybody expects him to stand. The question is, when, when do you think he might declare? When do you think we might hear something? Well, I, uh, I 
been told that it won't be tonight, but uh, having heard David Davis's news, who, who knows when? But I, I fully, I don't expect a statement until the morning. So your understanding from sources very close to Mr Howard was that the game plan was not until tomorrow? I don't know about the game plan, but if, 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 the, if Ian lost the election, then he would have to have time to think, and it, it was unlikely that he would make an announcement tonight. Now I want to ask you about Mr Howard's appeal, should he stand, because of course you all know him well. In public he often comes up across as quite tough, hard, yet he's got to charm the electorate. How's he going to do that? Well he always charms our electorate to get elected. All he's got to do is do that across the country. And I think you will have seen from the reaction of people here tonight, we all believe him to be a very thoroughly honest and nice man. And yes he is hard at times and do you not have to be hard to be a leader? Can he hold the party together? Because this is the problem, isn't it? As the vote showed for IDS, still deeply divided, this party. I think we saw signs of uh, reunification with David Davis's statement, and I think perhaps the MPs, even though they've gone through this process, will be taking great stock and realise that we can't have such things happening on a regular basis. David Monk, thanks very much for joining us here at the Hythe Conservative Club. And of course, that will be the task for whoever is the next leader. The word coronation has been used. Nobody here wants to say it publicly yet. Philippa, thank you very much. Well, it's very interesting, isn't it? Because it looks like all the pieces of the jigsaw are falling into place for Michael Howard, although, of course, no word from Mr Howard himself yet. I'm joined here on the College Green at Westminster by Quentin Davis, the Shadow Northern Ireland Secretary. Uh, Quentin Davis, you are an IDS supporter. Uh, first of all, I suppose you feel pretty sick this evening. Well, I feel very disappointed, certainly. Uh, Ian did a superb job. And I think it's only really now, quite belatedly, that some people begin to recognise that. But the bulk of the party uh, do recognise that, and I think the country recognises that. And it's under Ian we've really come out of the doldrums we've been in for the last uh, 10 or 12 years. And we've got a new policy focus and I think an entirely new image, entirely due to him. So, who succeeds him? Well, that's a question that's got to be decided over the next uh, week or, f or so. Uh, and uh, we have these uh, rules, as you know, and any, ca any colleague can uh, throw his hat in the ring and may do so between now and some date next week. But as far as I know, it hasn't been fixed yet. Yeah, well, we know roughly what the timetable is, that nominations uh, will close next Thursday and then, then the ballot will be a few days after that. So and we also know that uh, David Davis is not going to stand and he's throwing his weight behind Michael Howard. It's beginning to look like it's a shoo-in for him. Well, uh, we have to wait and see. I mean, I don't know uh, how colleagues are placed um, for obvious reasons. I haven't been talking to colleagues about what they might do in the event that Ian was uh, defeated because you know, I've been trying to work for Ian, Ian's success. Uh, and I think people will think uh, over the next few days, talk to their constituency associations, uh, come back on Monday, and I think then decisions will be taken as to uh, you know, who wants to stand. And we'll see whether there is a contest. As you know, uh, if there's a contest at all here, uh, then the two candidates go before the party in the country. Do you think there'll be a certain, I don't know, anxiety in the Conservative Party if it looks like behind some smoky committee room or tea bar in the House of Commons behind me, a deal is stitched together, the party is kept out of it, the workers are kept out of it, and suddenly a new leader emerges from the fog. Well, I, 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 if there were such a stitch up, yes, but I think there has been. You mustn't assume that because one colleague makes an announcement that he's not standing himself. And I can give you, make the same announcement now on your programme, John. <laughs> I'm not standing myself. Uh, that means there's a stitch up. No, but were you surprised then to hear um, David Davis say what he said? Well, I, I wasn't expecting it, certainly. Ah, so you thought he would be one of the front runners? I wasn't sure. I mean, to be honest, John, when you're involved uh, in an intense battle like this uh, uh, to try to get uh, your leader a vote of confidence, and of course there's a lot of tension and an enormous number of conversations with colleagues uh, uh, in, in a very short space of time, then you're focusing on the immediate uh, vote and you're not really looking beyond that. So I think we all need now to take stock and I don't think we should take any final decisions tonight. I think that'd be a great mistake. Well, but I'm just wondering whether that's the way it's moving. Well, I repeat, it would be a mistake to take such decisions tonight. Uh, and uh, I think we should all take stock over the next few days, discuss among ourselves how things should pan out, and talk to our constituents. That's very important, yeah, as you rightly say. I, I suppose this is a variation on the question that I just posed to you. But do you think it is desirable that 
there is a ballot of party members or do you think it would be a positively good thing if this can be sorted out at Westminster and it, there, there need be no ballot of the, in the uh, country? Well, let, let me tell you this, John. Uh, we, we, we set up a new, much more democratic constitution um, last time, in time for the, the vote which Ian won. And I think you, once you've gone the democratic route, you should not try to withdraw from it. And I think there would be disappointment in the, uh, uh, in the party and the country if they didn't uh, uh, have any um, choice to make. But if, on the other hand, there's complete unanimity among my colleagues, then it has to be said that any such, uh, any such choice or contest would be very artificial. Uh, so we'll have to wait and see. And it does, whether there's a contest, must depend upon people being willing to stand. OK. And you can't force them to stand. Sure. No, you can't force people to stand. But um, I just wonder whether you think the rules themselves need to be changed and changed fast. No, certainly not. We certainly can't but start changing... But these rules are bonkers, we aren't they? No, and we certainly can't start changing the rules now. You can't start changing the rules once the game has started. That's a no, no. Yeah, but in future, do you need to revisit this whole business where the, the leader gets, gets elected by the country and kicked out by the party uh, uh, well, personally, at Westminster. Personally, John, my instinct is not to throw away the rules. We've had many discussions in the past. Uh, there have always been some colleagues who have been dissatisfied with whatever rules we had. Uh, I'm inclined to, to uh, stick with these rules for a while, but certainly we can't change them for this contest. You can't change uh, the rules once the match has started. Well, the, yeah, but I just wonder whether you think that it's, you know, you've seen someone you've supported booted out tonight by a conspiracy. You think that's a good thing? You think that's the rules working well? Well, of course I don't think it's a good thing that Ian was booted out. Not at all. Absolutely not. But I'm not blaming the rules. Uh, I'm not blaming the rules. I mean, this was the result of uh, what has happened over the last few weeks. It's a result of a campaign against Ian Duncan Smith, which I personally think was misconceived and was very unfair. Uh, but nevertheless, it has been successful. OK. Um, I suppose a final thought. What is going to be, I don't know, the final verdict on IDS? Wasn't up to the job? Oh, no. I think I, well, IDS is going to go down in history. Uh, I'm sure I have a future career, which is very distinguished, but he's already got his place in history as the man who brought us out of the doldrums. Uh, uh, we've been 10 points and more below in the polls for more than 10 years, and we're not. We're, not. we're now, now you know, running neck and neck with the government. What's more, he's given us a new policy focus and a new confidence, and that's a tremendous achievement. OK. Quentin Davis, thank you very much indeed. Well, you can probably hear what time it is now. There you are. It's 8 o'clock. I waited for that big, bon big Ben Bong just there so that no one thought I was lying about the time. Uh, let us look back at the day's events so far because it has been another extraordinary day for Westminster. Let's get this report from Martin Popperwell. Ladies and gentlemen, I am in a position to announce the result of the vote of confidence in Ian Duncan Smith as leader of the Conservative Party. They voted 75 in favour of Mr Duncan Smith's leadership of the party. They voted 90 as not confident in his leadership. I therefore announce that the motion of confidence has been defeated. A few minutes later, Ian Duncan Smith made this statement. The Parliamentary Party has spoken, the announcement has been made, and I will stand down as leader when a successor has finally been chosen. I will give that leader my absolute loyalty and support, whoever it is.